My name is Arun Swaminath. I'm an associate professor of medicine at the Hofstra School of Medicine. I'm the director of the IBD program at Lenox Hill Hospital. Today, our topic is medical cannabis as it relates to the management of patients with inflammatory bowel disease and is being presented by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. So today, we'll cover several topics in, in our agenda. We'll talk about the cannabis timeline and legalization, the medical effects of cannabis, what are the data in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, what about the terminology and medical legalization, the different products that include medical cannabis, medical cannabis in special populations such as pregnancy and pediatrics, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation position statement on medical cannabis, and ongoing research on cannabis in IBD. You can see cannabis has been around for a really long time and actually dates back to almost 5,000 years ago. Um, but the science of it was actually studied in more detail in the early 1900s. In 1996, California became the first state to legalize marijuana, although in 1971, it was scheduled as a Schedule I drug and was basically illegal as, as a federal statute. So the more recent history around, care, uh, around cannabis, in 1970, the Controlled Substances Act essentially classified marijuana as a Schedule I drug, which means that it has a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. In 1986, the first synthetic uh, THC, essentially the active ingredient in marijuana, uh, was manufactured and was called Runabinol and was approved for the management of AIDS cachexia. And that was classified as a Schedule II drug, which meant that it was uh, allowed to be prescribed by the medical community. In 1996, California approves medical marijuana. In 1999, Dronabinol and THC were reclassified to Schedule III. Multiple attempts for reclassification of marijuana from Schedule I to Schedule II or III have been ineffective. In 2009, a Justice Department memo essentially deprioritized the prosecution of marijuana crimes in states where medical marijuana was legal. In 2012, Colorado became the first state to approve recreational marijuana. In 2018, the Attorney General at the time, Jeff Sessions, rescinded this memo and the existing laws against marijuana use, possession, and transportation may be prosecuted as a result. This may be up to the individual state's attorney generals. We have to wait and see. As of November 2018, this is a map of the United States where the states in dark green have legalized cannabis for recreational use. In light green, these states have allowed marijuana for medical use, and in gray, they are prohibited uh, from any use. Again, these are state laws and differ from federal statute, which still considers an illegal substance. So an overview of cannabis and cannabis physiology. Cannabis contains over 500 chemical compounds with more than 60 unique cannabinoids that have individual effects. Cannabinoids are basically chemicals that can attach and activate the cannabinoid receptors in the body, and they have downstream effects. There are endogenous cannabinoids that are made in the human body and attached to cannabinoid receptors. There are phytocannabinoids that are made by pl plants, such as cannabis sativa. And there are synthetic cannabinoids, such as dronabinol or other drugs that are made in the lab, such as K2 or spice. There are two principal cannabinoids that have been the most well-studied as a uh, byproduct of cannabis. The first is THC, which is uh, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD, which is cannabidiol. There is some understanding of why cannabis might work in inflammatory bowel disease to control symptoms and inflammation through the activation of the endocannabinoid system. Signaling systems found in all mammals regulate numerous body functions, including cognition and memory, coordination, pain perception, heart rate, immune function, appetite metabolism, and GI motility. 
you can imagine to treat the complaints of inflammatory bowel disease, having control over pain, immune function, and GI motility would be advantageous. There are two well-described cannabinoid receptors. The first is CB1, which is highly expressed in the brain and various nervous system cells. CB2 receptors are highly expressed in immune cells and some gut cells as well. THC mainly activates the CB1 receptors and accounts for the psychoactive effects seen with uh, marijuana or can cannabis use. And CBD binds CB1 and CB2 very weakly. CBD has minimal psychoactive effects and mostly works through other cannabinoid receptors like GPR55 and TRPV1. So the effects of cannabis is mediated through the cannabinoid system, which is typically mediated through CB1 and CB2 receptors. Activating CB1 and CB2 will increase cannabinoid tone. Blocking the effects of CB1 and CB2 will decrease cannabinoid tone. These have clinical consequences. Decreased cannabinoid tone may decrease vomiting, but increase diarrhea. Increasing cannabinoid tone will typically decrease heartburn complaints, decrease vomiting, decrease acid secretion, decrease diarrhea, and decrease visceral pain. A number of studies have pointed out that IBD patients do use cannabis, and this was before it became decriminalized in the U.S. and before it became legal to use in Canada, which happened just recently. In Canada, 50% of IBD patients in one survey reported cannabis use, and most often they used it to control complaints around pain, diarrhea, or appetite. A study from Massachusetts found that increase in cannabis by patients with IBD increased from about 12% in 2012 to 22% in 2017 after decriminalization. More than 50% of patients said that legalization did not affect their likelihood of use. In Colorado, 32% of adolescents with inflammatory bowel disease have used cannabis, and 9% in fact are habitual daily users. And again, the most common complaint that was addressed with the use of cannabis was for complaints of abdominal pain. In Connecticut, up to 70% of pediatric IBD patients, typically aged 18 to 21, have used cannabis in some manner and the vast majority of patients did not discuss their cannabis use with their gastroenterologists. Here we show the evidence from preclinical studies for the activity of cannabis in inflammatory bowel disease. In animal models, which have colitis that is chemically induced, as well as gene knockout models, there are clearly anti-inflammatory effects that have been noted across animal models and across different types of injuries. In human preclinical studies, these are typically immune system cells from patients with IBD or cells from intestinal biopsy of affected patients have also shown evidence of anti-inflammatory activity. To summarize, in animal models, colitis can be improved or blocked by modulating the cannabinoid, especially CB2 receptors. Cells from IBD patients show higher levels of endocannabinoids and CB2 receptors, and CBD decreases pro-inflammatory pro cytokines in mice models, human immune system cells, and cells from UC patients. There are a number of survey studies, and you can see them briefly summarized here, in which patients were asked whether they used marijuana and if they did, how much it helped them, and what it helped them with. You can see across studies there are improvements in pain, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and improvements in appetite and nausea. Here we summarize some of the evidence for cannabis use in inflammatory bowel disease, both in Crohn's and in ulcerative colitis. In Crohn's disease, much of the data has come from Israel, specifically one author, Naftali, um, and has been um, published in major journals. Uh, the first uh, paper that was published in 2013, looking at uh, cannabis in the form of uh, cigarettes administered uh, twice a day with about 150 milligrams of THC content versus placebo cigarettes. They found that 90% of patients in the cannabis group 
compared to just 40% of patients in the placebo group had a clinical response as measured by improvements in CDAI, and this was statistically significant. Patients also experienced improvements in the quality of life with cannabis use. However, uh, all patients who achieved a response um, lost the response within two weeks of discontinuing uh, cannabis, suggesting that there was no change to the underlying biology with cannabis use. An additional criticism was that patients who were receiving cannabis cigarettes uh, could clearly tell the difference based on psychotropic effects compared to the placebo group, which would not feel such effects, and hence the study could not be truly blinded. A second study uh, looking just at CBD oil uh, found that uh, patients uh, exposed to CBD versus placebo did not notice a significant uh, benefit. And one of the criticisms behind this study was whether this study used too low a dose of CBD to find uh, any improvement. And it was a small study. In ulcerative colitis, a CBD-rich extract uh, with about 4.7% uh, concentration of THC was used compared to placebo. It's hard to reach any conclusions from this study because there were so many protocol deviations, but it did show that there was an improvement in the partial Mayo score. Uh, finally, uh, another study from Naftali looking at uh, cannabis cigarettes, again, two per day, with the same amount of THC content were com uh, was compared to placebo. This is not a fully published paper, but the early data showed that there are no changes in CRP or fecal calprotectin, suggesting that there was no underlying improvement in the inflammation, although the clinical score, the Lichtiger score, did show improvement. Um, uh, CRP is a blood biomarker that can reflect inflammation in patients, and fecal calprotectin is a stool biomarker that reflects inflammation typically from the colon, but also as well as the small bowel. Hence, improvements in blood CRP or stool fecal calprotectin will suggest that there is an improvement in the underlying inflammation as opposed to an improvement in diarrhea or pain that are not related to inflammation but are affected by changes to motility based on the underlying drug that's administered. So are there benefits to using cannabis in patients with Crohn's disease? The first small study showed a decreased steroid requirement associated with cannabis use. Again, uh, the question here is whether the underlying biology changed and hence the steroids were no longer required or whether the complaints that the steroids treated were also addressed by the cannabis such as pain and diarrhea, but without any actual change to the inflammatory process. The follow-up to the first randomized controlled trial in 21 patients showing overall clinical improvement, uh, again, this is the Noctily trial showing that uh, cannabis uh, in the form of cigarettes smoked twice a day for eight weeks did show an improvement in uh, quality of life and that a significant number of patients achieved clinical remission. But this wasn't statistically different and again, the same criticism, which is that there is no improvement in anemia, meaning that patients' blood count did not improve, and there was no improvement in the C-reactive protein, which is, again, a blood biomarker of inflammation, did not improve. The data in ulcerative colitis is even more limited. Uh, the first randomized control trial in 60 patients that were stable on mesalamine therapy, only 59% of patients actually completed the um, a treatment which is once uh, daily CBD-rich extract versus placebo, and there was no difference in remission rate. However, there was a trend toward an improved quality of life. An unpublished trial of medical cannabis with uh, 28 patients smoking two uh, cannabis cigarettes daily versus placebo did show an improvement in clinical symptoms and colonoscopy, but again, this is unpublished um, and we're unable to critique the study uh, or to understand what exactly uh, the endoscopy showed before and after treatment. Again, it's significant to note that biomarkers such as CRP and fecal calprotectin in this unpublished study also did not improve. So to summarize, uh, cannabinoids have been shown to reduce inflammation in different animal models of inflammatory bowel disease, as well as human cell lines from patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Most patient surveys show that the majority of IBD patients who use cannabis 
note improvement in pain, diarrhea, appetite, and nausea. Data from human trials with cannabis or cannabinoids lags behind and is far from conclusive in showing these same benefits. There are several cannabinoids that are available commercially. Dronabinol, which is a synthetic THC agent, uh, which was approved in the 90s for anorexia in HIV and AIDS patients and nausea and vomiting in patients with chemotherapy. This is available in the U.S. and is a Schedule III drug as well as available in other countries. Nabilone, which is a THC analog, uh, has been approved to treat nausea and vomiting in patients undergoing chemotherapy and is considered a Schedule II drug in the United States and is available elsewhere. Nabiximol, which is a combination of THC and CBD, has been approved to treat pain and multiple sclerosis outside the U.S., specifically in Canada and Sweden. And Epidiolex, which is CBD, is used to treat a rare form of pediatric epilepsy called the Lennox-Gastault syndrome and the Dravet syndrome. It has only just recently been approved in the U.S., and the scheduling is still unclear. There are risks associated with cannabis use, and here we have a summary of the possible risks and the overall confidence in the statement that's made. For example, that there is uh, a relationship to addiction or dependence to marijuana and other substances with marijuana use. The data behind this is consistent, and hence there is a high level of confidence in that statement unlike an association with lung cancer in which there is a low level of confidence. There, is an, there are several things that should be um, highlighted, uh, including that there's a dependence issue with marijuana in adults. It's about 9% in uh, adolescents and children. It's about 17%. That there is an uh, increase in motor vehicle accidents and typically that is a much more severe impairment when marijuana is combined with alcohol. That marijuana, when it is delivered in a form of a cigarette, can be associated with chronic bronchitis, and that overall marijuana use in habitual users has been associated with a diminished lifetime achievement. What are the risks specifically in patients with IBD? Most IBD studies do not show any significant adverse effects, with the caveat that the study sizes are small, in total covering less than 130 patients, and with only short-term follow-up. There have been risks that have been shown in studies, such as discontinuation of conventional therapy, and hence an increased risk of relapse of the disease, as well as an increase in risk for surgery and Crohn's disease. And it's not clear whether this is truly related to marijuana use as opposed to discontinuing conventional therapy or the fact that these patients did not have benefits from conventional therapy. 